welcome everybody to our meeting. Um, All right, we're going to shift straight to number five on the agenda to offer a presentation on the SAR framework report card make result, and then we'll come back to the other stuff. So, okay. let me just switch the thing. Oh, you got to log out of this. Nope. Oh. It's just going to be there. Oh. And another. I think it's set up. Can I suggest an administrative change that that sort of normally be the practice then? Well, we are here. <laughs> um, so thank you for having us. Uh, we had a very busy fall at Aussie. Uh, we released a lot of data, a lot of assessment results, and a lot of DC school report card data, and a lot of graduation rates. And uh, at the request of the executive director, and I think uh, another member of the board, we wanted to come and preview those findings with you, and also make sure that you and your staff know where all of the resources are available to you as you have conversations throughout the day. Uh, I sent over a pretty lengthy deck. I did not print out the entire deck because it is a very, like, I took all of our public releases and aggregated them in one thing, and then I pulled out stuff. So, we got some things to say. Uh oh. So tonight we're going to discuss our NAEP results, uh, we're going to discuss graduation rates, uh, we will talk about our DC school report card release, and at the board approved cut scores and had a panel uh, with science educators uh, late last year, we will talk, we will release our DC science results and we will present those findings to you as well. So as you know by now, DC continued to show significant improvement on the nation's report so in October, the Department of Education released results on the National Assessment for Educational Progress. And we know that this assessment is one of the, way, one of the ways that we can compare how we are performing across other jurors, uh, with other jurisdictions. The 29 assessment of NAEP, our 2019 assessment of NAEP shows that DC continues to be the fastest improving state in the nation. And we are continuing to uh, close gaps between student groups in DC, and we have caught up with our national peers. <clears throat> Uh, over a decade ago, D.C. was far behind the rest of the nation, but now D.C. is ahead of five states in fourth grade reading and ahead of six states in Title VII in fourth grade math. We still have a lot of work to do, but D.C. is starting to catch up with the pack. We saw impressive gains in three out of four subject grade areas, so we gained three scale score points in fourth grade math, eighth grade math, and eighth grade reading, and we showed not statistically significant gains in uh, DC was only was the only state that showed statistically significant gains in eighth grade reading, while 31 states showed a statistical decline. So one of the major findings out of this is that DC is starting to catch up, and everyone else in the nation, all the other states, are starting to are, are not showing that progress. So for comparison, for public schools nationally, um, the nation public schools gained one scale score point in fourth grade math between 17 and 19 and showed statistically significant declines in the remaining three subject grade assessments. So you will begin to see some in the national media that national progress in educational outcomes is staying flat. Uh, and usually that's where um, people are getting that information is from the most recent assessment. So what is available to you? You will find our on our website at this link, you will find our public NAEP results presentation, which I put together in your deck, uh, there are graphs with scale scores, comparisons, and different cuts of the data by subgroup. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with the NAEP, you will find background information on the administration of NAEP, FAQs, uh, and sample questions. And you will also find not only our state results, but DCPS participates in an assessment with other school districts, the TUDA. So you will also find DCPS's results uh, on, on the TUDA, and you can compare that
Sure. The, um, the NAEP is a sample of students in school, so it's not all the students in all the schools. Is that correct? DC is a take all um, city because of our size. So all students in grade four Practice test and sample question. Is that um, is that a, is that when it says that the practice is that a practice test or is it a real test? It's practice. It's not release items. I can check to see if there are release items available, but that is just a practice set. Um, the way it's this is the way you make this design is that students take little um, kind of sub testlets. They don't take the whole thing. That's why you sample um, across a large group of students in a large group of states. So you'll see little test lists that students can get familiar with the types of things they'll be seeing on campus. And then do they, do they spend that? When is the name? Name is typically administered January through March every other year. And there are studies in between on the on off days. So one day let's, versus let's other say last year before. when they took the test. Mm -hmm. So they were take they were practice getting ready for the NAIC test and they were also getting ready for the uh, bar test. They're not admitted. So it, it's, I think it's interesting. Um, they're not admitted at the same time. The windows are different intentionally. So they come earlier in the year. And they're also getting into a much shorter um, chunk of time. Um, NAEP is an eight day. It's usually one day in the school unless you need to do that. Um, and the administrators come in with all the technology and their leave. So it's a pretty low burden on administration. Uh, and, uh, um, coming from being a teacher. Yeah. that my, my thought on that generally is that um, if students have the opportunity to practice the technology and the platform is really important, but that the goal is that you demonstrate what you can know and can do based on the training that you've taught and based on the instruction you have. So coming from me, uh, the administrative burden is intended to be quite light. But I completely respect the notion. Any other but we'll go on to graduation rates. We also released our four-year adjusted cohort graduation rate over the fall. Uh, our graduation rate for 18-19 remained flat from the previous year at 68.2%. Remember the four-year adjusted cohort rate is prescribed in federal law that students based on the year that they enter ninth grade, they have four years in the subsequent summer um, to, to, to graduate. Uh, as you'll recall, when we, when we did STAR, we had the standard graduation um, graduation course a five-year and an extended graduation rate all of that information is data from the so the table shows that the state was at 68.2 percent DCPS at 65.1 percent for DCPS that's a 3.5 percentage point drop from the prior year for public charter schools 76.4 percent which is a four percentage point We also provide graduation, four-year graduation rates by student group, and you can see that information here at the state, DCPS, and public charter school levels. Uh, you'll see that divided by gender, by race, at risk, English learners, and students with disabilities. Justin, can I just ask one question? Yep. Um, so on the DCPS rate, so down uh, the 3.5 points, and then two years ago was the year that the, all the numbers were readjusted, is that right? And then the next year it went down because when after after Austin did the report after the scandal, they re, the numbers were redone. There were no publicly reported graduation rates that were reposted. But the year after the year after after the state began implementing its own policies according to its either new policies or implementing policies in Delhi, we did see a drop in that graduation rate and the yeah, that's what it's this is the second year. Yeah, that's this is, correct. This so I think it is not unanticipated that those policies and um, enforcing them or applying them with rigor might um, show a little that it's not entirely surprising that we would see a drop a second year, although we know that they're working really closely to implement some of the new things to get uh, the credits that you get with them. So 
and not only new things. So I mean, as you'll recall, we took possibly some ideas of a corrective action plan, uh, a two-year corrective action plan that was built to continue longer uh, around their action plan. And we have consistently reported how the things that action plan on our website say. In terms of like what the business world defined um, educationally disengaged, I believe that this means that they are not currently enrolled anywhere okay. as of the moment that we calculate those things. Or we're not enrolled after four, after four, but after we should, we can check on that business for free. I don't, I don't want to speak. Okay. I'm not entirely certain. But, but if I'm following you correctly, it would have been um, the number of students, I guess, of that total 822 that were enrolled in October. Some, at some point over the course of the school year were unenrolled. Only 10 of those over the course of that school year re-engaged at some point in academic education. I should go, I don't want to totally speak out of turn because I don't have all the details and I don't want to make different slightly more nuanced, but what I believe that this is, is that like we have the people who graduated, right. all of the people who did not graduate, there's a percent who were enrolled in school, so they were not disengaged, Percent who are who, for, for some other reason, did not graduate, uh, got a G, for example, got a GED or went on to, and then there is a number who are neither enrolled in school nor do we have documentation that they were that they were um, that is a, that's a different credential. Right. 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 So so, so these should all add up to one hundred fourteen point nine plus the number of days. Yeah, and so um, and so. Yes, and so there, there may be these, these students may come back right. after that time, but this is but it is a point in time at the time we collect it. Gotcha. And so for the reengagement center, um, our reengagement center does attempt um, work to reengage students up into I think 22 or 24, and to try and uh, connect those students with a variety of educational options, um, including adult cohort alternative schools. Um, if they're not going to be enrolled directly back into a high school. Um, sometimes other kind of adult education settings and other rec also provides significant support to get the wraparound services a, a disengaged student might need to get back to school if that is not other supports or child or employment. Um, adult and alternative schools do capture some students after they, be, they, come, they become disengaged and come back. And so a number of those schools are attempting, yeah, the DC, um, DCBS state programs as well as charter schools. Um, who have programming that might attract students who became disengaged with a four-year high school and maybe not want to go back to a traditional high school, um, but want to further their education. Yeah, I think that's important. When I was working at the Department of Employment Services, we were co-located next to the engagement center. Mm -hmm. So I think just generally for folks who know students or, or families of students who become educationally disengaged, I know that it's a staff over there that's doing a good job. So that's a good point. Remembering our conversations around uh, accountability and our safety, we, this was this was one of the things that occurred to the last person we to discuss. Is that the four-year adjusted cohort will still be the uh, Hey, we still we still want people to work with students even if it takes five years or six years. That's why we start. We include a multiple. 
to get to a 16.7% uh, the students that are in the cohort are still enrolled in school. And we want to make sure that we're, we're, one of the things that we're doing is trying to make sure that you have every incentive to provide great education to, to those students. I have a couple of questions about that. I, I know that uh, the cohort, the cohort is, is figured out when they're freshmen. Has there been any change in the, what's going on with, like we, we would have, because there's so much movement in the city, that we would have students who were freshmen, but they were also counted towards our graduation rate four years later. If we couldn't find out where they were. Yes, that's part of the required federal methodology related to how you calculate a cohort, which is a cohorts begin with that, with, with sort of like locked in, and you can remove students if we can document where else they are. And so many schools, we have a very, very rigorous documentation process in DC, like with most other states related to this actually. And we have schools, you know, tracking down with students who have moved to other jurisdictions, um, or obviously internal mobility within the district or the private school or, or you know, other educational opportunities. But the methodology related to who and how you're allowed to remove cohorts is a federally um, mandated methodology. And there's some some pluses to that because we want, um, you know, it is a reflection of what's happening to those students over time. So, does that BS under currently educationally disengaged? Um, what does that mean? It means data suppressed. Okay, why is that? I don't remember in this particular case why some are in less than ten, some are data suppressed. I'd have to go back and look at that. It has to do with the how we report numbers that are really small, but I don't remember the specific Because I know, I know that the, the counselors and the uh, attendance officers spent an inordinate amount of time trying to track down students who were no longer at the county surrounding and within the charter, you know, once charter schools started being a viable alternative, it was really hard to find out where students down for schools because we have stronger tracking of students and English learning within appropriate limits at the state level between schools. So we, because we have <coughs> more sophisticated um, internal data infrastructure over time, we've been able to minimize, not entirely, but in many cases minimize that burden um, because we're able to share more quickly where students have gone. So that information goes back to the Correct. So, like, it all feeds to us, and then there's like some mixing and matching of student identification numbers, and um, if there's duplicates or if there's some missing, we can identify where they went. So we're able to feed that data to schools. So um, the school is starting on the list if you've already captured these people, you just need to figure out. The school yeah, I mean, I don't want to oversimplify all the work my our robust team and the students yeah. at LEAs do related to this end data tracking, but it should have improved at least some somewhat over time because of to share once they give it to us in a standardized way. Does a student ID number follow that student regardless of where they go in the city yes. in the public school? Yes. Oh, that's great. Um, I'm sorry, just out of curiosity, maybe you answered this, but I might have been a little confused. Um, for instance, for a student who may, for instance, enter school X February of their senior year or February of their junior year, how is How are they calculated in the graduation rate, for instance, which I can't speak for? So, it also depends on. <laughs> yeah. So, so this, when did the student, let's say they were Y9 in this cohort, right? Uh -huh. When they move, like they're going to count for us at the state level. Like if they move within the state, oh, like we, just, we adjust the cohort right. based on their movement. Oh, uh, yes, it's yeah. not school level. Yeah, yeah. I mean, school. there are school level, but the right. rules for the school versus the, de for the district. Or versus the LEA are cascading, not related to each other, but they're different. Uh, I should probably see. Yeah, so we can take it offline. Yeah. We can get like a yeah. more sophisticated yeah. data tutorial about the business rules because they are extremely complicated, but they're they're related to one another. In that way. And you want you fundamentally want that to be smoother. So right. Yeah. 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 Ye
you want an evidence threshold of like, I'm pulling you out of the cohort, somebody is going to get you before you send them to the cohort. Uh, additional resources here, five-year ACGR rates are online, historic graduation rates are online, and then also you can find spreadsheets on the school level rates, and of course, the graduation rate data is the school level. Which, transitions to uh, all right, um, so we'll move um, through DC School Report Card, and many of you have seen versions of this presentation, so I'm happy to answer questions, but I'll just walk through quickly. Um, as you know, we released this um, in late November. November. <laughs> it was early. I can't figure out if it was yesterday or a year ago. So, um, so the school report card um, came out again, providing really transparent information about every school in the district. We've made some upgrades based on feedback about clarity of information um, and, um, and rearranging some of the priority information that people wanted and adding a few new things as we went. So we're really excited about that. As you know, it includes the star ratings um, in addition to other materials. And we're really excited that we have discussion guides um, for parents and families as well, in addition to the sort how to do. We publish discussion guides, which is like as you're looking at this information, here are some <laughs> things that you could discuss um, with your teacher, with your school, with your community. And so it's just meant to be a, a, like a, a, a thought prompt for, um, for parents and families and, and other community members as they're looking at this information. So the, the format of those discussion guides. Um, which are like, what is the piece of data or information that you're looking at? What was measured in as plain language as we can while still being clear? Why is it important? And then questions you can ask. Obviously, it's not limited to any of these questions, but we just hope that this will be a resource to people as we're trying to make meaning of this information um, over time. So we are very excited to see that 76 schools across DC earned four and five star ratings this year, which is an increase over previous years. Um, and indicating that more students are attending schools earning four and five star ratings. Um, you know, the, the, the standards are left the same year over year in this case, and so what it is showing is, according to the standards that we together set um, last year, more schools are doing it now, which is exciting. Like we said, you know, what people say, um, you know, that when you measure something, you want to see progress against it, and that's what we're doing, and that's, and that's exciting, particularly because of the multiple measures that we have, and that includes, um, you know, growth, um, and 20, uh, and, and we have a five-star school in every ward, which is exciting to show that this progress that schools are making it can and is happening across the city. And that's really meaningful to all of our students and to our schools as well. 27% um, of schools improved by more than one star rating. And more than 62,000 people have used the DC report card as of the time that we published this. Um, so we're really excited to see uh, that it is being used. Um, and that the information is going to be current and will continue to be current so people can check that um, and see what progress is being made. And as we are, you know, at us here having our meetings, we're also trying to encourage people to go back and use this information for more things. One of the things that we talked about together when we were working through the ASIC task force is that we can have common conversations knowing that we have this common reference point. So if an advocate is coming to you or a parent is coming to you or you're talking to a school or we're having a conversation, we can refer back to this information and it's there for everybody. Everybody has equal access to it. Um, we are going to be conducting our DC All Star School School Tour. Um, we did this last year and then published a report where uh, the superintendent and staff went to go visit schools, usually in a really small cohort, and meet directly with educators, um, document what is working in, in schools, and then publish reports. And here's what we learned, and here's what we recommend other people could investigate in scaling or funding or etc. When we look at Right now, we don't have. So the funding that we made available last year was for the for the um, schools in the bottom five percent of star ratings, and that huge investment of money, eleven million dollars approximately, will carry them for three years. In terms of the schools that went down, what we did this year is connect with them directly, connect with their LEA, articulate to them where they should be looking to understand why they went down. Because we have multiple measures, it's not just one thing that could change your school. And so what we wanted to do is provide them guiding questions to say, 
where could you be looking if your star ratings indicate that for your school, this is what happened. Um, did your math growth go down? Did your attendance change? You know, did your, you know, did your, did your scores raise that your growth didn't change? Like, oh, your growth, you know, there's many, many um, reasons why scores could have changed. And in some cases it was, you know, okay, this was on the border. But in some cases it would be indicating, okay, you need to do like some major work on this for our tool. So we try to give them those tools to um, look at it themselves and then direct them to, um, uh, professional development that ASI is hosting if they don't have the access to that in their own LEA. Um, we're also making a recommitted effort, as we talked about when we released this, that, the, that our math scores, as we talked about in Clark, have not been growing very strongly the way we'd like to. So we made a, set, a secondary investment in professional development related to math um, so that we can sort of support the schools in that area. Great point. I think the point of going and actually doing a visit is sort of like a, a little qualitative research project, actually. And they were selected the same way we selected before. It's not just like we're going to the top ten list schools by score. We looked at all this, all of them, and did sort of a qualitative assessment to say who is showing interesting growth in these areas, hoping to get a diverse representative sample. So, you know, for example, these are not all of my current schools. We're looking at schools like, oh, this school had growth in terms of disabilities outcomes, or this school had. Change in attendance. So what we're doing is going and documenting that. I don't think we brought any of the um, star reports, but we'll send the link to John Paulson because I think you can see it um, also. And we will publish either mm -hmm. commonalities or things that make them super unique that like someone else could be doing. And that's a great point. We should think about how to communicate that back to school that had changes in like some of the other things that they might be doing. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, oh, so, so go ahead, John. I was just going to talk about resources too, but go ahead. But, um, how many schools moved up to scores? I don't think I have that piece right in front of me, but we can get that. I think that that's something that's, that we should be concerned about whether mm -hmm. the schools went up to or went down to. Because if you look at this, uh, in 2018, you have 19 schools that got one star. I don't, I can't give you that well, direct data, but I, I know many of you are, yeah, we have it, it should be on our, in our big file. Um, I was just thinking and math and Alex sent us an analysis that talks about the number of schools that went up three stars. We have, like, we, we already have it in our email. Right, but I'm not just talking about going up two stars. I'm talking about going down two stars. Yeah. Because of, because, you know, not as, I would say, I don't have the exact number, but, we, but many fewer raised, many fewer had bigger amounts. You know, there were fewer schools that had two star increases or decreases across the board. That was not as common. But, I don't, but I'd be worried about all this um, research that needs to be there. Which is great. We're glad that you need your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that makes us very happy. Oh, yeah. And I just have two really quick questions. Um, and I may have just been better. Right. The All-Star schools, are those schools that are not at least one? Or how, what are the, what? We just, we didn't have a strict criteria that way. And so some of, I mean, in general, these were schools that had um, gains in at least an area that we were interested in. So we did not, part of this, we, when we talk about the, this, what we call our all-star school score, it is not like a new numerical cut score. It is, it, it is a collection of schools that we think we can learn from. Um, and even some of them may have stayed the same, but seen growth in a particular area that we think is interesting that we want to learn from. And so after we visit them, we'll, we'll write out, like, here's why this school is selected, here's what the teachers and leaders and, and students said, and here's what we think other people can learn from it. But it's, we, we on purpose made it less of like a statistical, mathematical choice, because we think there's lots of things to learn, and we don't want to like restrict or create some new, you know, badge that, or like a rating. So can you share just some of the research that you 
So in the past, we like last year, and I can't remember this. It's been a while since I've read the report. We we highlighted people for reductions in lab tests and tier one in particular, and then the superintendent got to meet with me to look at how we were going to engage with students and on, on at the family level, the school level, to improve the tests. Those are the types of things we're looking for, and we believe that we can find those people throughout the program. Um, so we kind of made it a little bit more hospitalized. We went to a school and I. Sorry, I don't have it in front of me. Um, we had significant increases in our students with disabilities framework. We went um, and and talked to the students and the teachers and said, "What did you do here? And and how? Why? How? Do, why do you think this is a change?" In this case, it turned out actually that they had been a recipient of a um, a seat grant from Aussie, uh, a special education enhancement fund grant that they could use specifically um, to do a number of things, including hire more of the support specialists in their school to implement a whole school model that they thought would support. And they had, um, oh, thank you, Marie Reed, and, oh yeah, thank you, Steve Webb is amazing. <laughs> uh, Perry Street is the school. Lot. Thank you. It's online. <laughs> Perry Street is the school I'm talking about. Um, they, they, they were awarded a grant, um, used it to, um, in, uh, in part, uh, enhance their, their staffing support for behavior specialists in their schools, saw decreases in discipline, increases in attendance, and increases in student outcomes. And so that school at the time, you know, it's not that they were necessarily a five-star school in the star, but we had seen from the data that they were, that in this particular area, they had seen some growth, and we were really interested in knowing what that was. So that's one example. We, we can just, we kind of look across the board, like, who's doing really well, who has made gains where we didn't anticipate it, and are there sp specific student groups in which language learners, things like FRS, students with disabilities were showing like a literal paper report last year, which is also online. Maybe you, you could send, jump on the link and just give it to you guys. Um, and you know, it was like eight pages or something like that. And so we're not doing a super, super sophisticated 10 year longitudinal qualitative research analysis. We are going, we're talking, we're listening, um, and we're just saying here's some interesting things that other people can learn from. One thing too, remember when we approved uh, content for kind of the report card, uh, we did But we did include uh, enrollment, uh, college enrollment registration information. So that's a new that's a new data point that we can get into uh, into more in the next couple months. Is it part of the rating or just it's, it's, it's not a part of the rating, but it's on the it's on the it's, it's, it's a report card. Emily, this is an example. I as I did a little looking at the two schools that are in Texas, <laughs> um, on the everyday counts data that we got from John Hall earlier this week or last week, Richard Wright saw that significant decrease in their chronic absenteeism. So my hunch is that that'll be something that Ozzy's asking about there because that was a big one that week of the awards that Cole went and that was something that they did really well. And so, oops, um, Sorry. yeah, Re resources, there's a lot of them, check them out, they're pretty cool. Uh, got lots of data presentations, but on the website for families, a lot of frequently asked questions, discussion guide, user guide, videos um, that help walk through you to share those with people as well, even if it's educators or folks in the community. Um, it, um, we, think, we think they're helpful, but we also want feedback. If they're not, or uh, something else would be helpful, we want to make sure that we're investing our, our resources and stuff that um, we can get out of the community. Is there any kind of data on uh, the, since the star rating came out in the, uh, in the November or December of 2018, um, of how many lottery student parents that went for the lottery would went to the four and five star school rather than the one or two star school. I have to defer to my student C on that, so let me get back to you about the data about that. And I'd like to know if we can get that published because we also did it for this this year's lottery too. Because I know that you know like just when you had that thing about the star tour right you know the, everybody wants to go to a everybody wants their children to go to a five-star school right that's what that's what we as parents would want right and 
and it's really hard to convince people to, for their children to go to a porn store. If, they, if there's that kind of belief, I'm not a big star of full color paint. Um, but I, it just, it's, it's always bothered me even before it came out. Because I, I knew that the Dozo High School was going to be a porn store. There was no way in the world it, it wasn't. But, you know, how do you recruit students to a porn store? Before answering Jessica has a comment, I have a comment, and then we can take, take all of them and bring them. I just want to share with my colleagues, if you haven't read the DME's latest Ed Site report, it's about the lottery access and the star ratings of schools. Um, and so the, the most recent one they did this week, they talked about the fact that there's like 10,000, I'm going to try and remember the number, it's like 10,000 unduplicated applicants applying to uh, schools that had three stars or more. And when they looked at that, they found that of that 10,000, of those 10,000 applicants, 2,400 had no access via their by right school, the school in their neighborhood, or because they didn't match in the lottery to a school that had three stars or more. Then they looked at all the applicants for four plus star schools and folks who didn't match to anything. So those were 10,000 people who didn't match to the three plus star schools. Then they had the four plus star schools and they found that more than 5,000 students didn't have access to a three plus star school and were on a wait list for a four star school or higher. So I think your point is right that folks are trying to get access to higher quality schools. But I think the other thing that that data shows is that there's a lot of kids in the city that even if they went to their neighborhood school, can't access a school that is a three or better star school, which I, I interpret the stars as meeting accountability expectations, meaning what we as a state have said is what we want for our schools to be doing. Three stars, four stars, five stars is like they're on the right track to meet college and career ready standards, both for attendance, for uh, proficiency, for growth, for all those things. So to me, the biggest takeaway from that data um, is there's a lot of kids who simply don't have any access at all. Um, they can't get it through their neighborhood schools, and the lottery is making it such that lots of different people are applying, and tons of kids are getting shut out of quality schools. Um, so I'm really curious to keep digging in on how we see schools do this growth and show growth in their own capacity to educate kids well, but also how we grow the supply of schools that are providing quality education. But if you haven't seen it, the Ed Site stuff would be really interesting and a little bit into that. Yeah, and, and a lot of my constituents take umbrage with the fact that I have star school is necessarily better for their students. <coughs> Some of my constituents value uh, diversity and inclusion more than they value a star rating. Oh, I so, so I think that we need to make a blank that all parents want their students to go to a five-star school. There, there, are, there are other metrics. That's not what I meant. Okay, that's what not I, what I, Okay, well, your interpretation is wrong. What I meant was, because I taught in the five-star or one-star school for 40 years, is that it wasn't a one-star school. The things that were going on, we were graduating kids. They were going to college. They were going on and being successful. But the way that the rating system is set up is that is it doesn't identify Everything. Yeah. So, I just want to give you guys on that. I actually read this on a, on a actually a New York picture, but well, close enough. Um, um, a principal was asking about, you know, if the, the let me back up. So I think this is especially true for high school students who are you know, probably making the point about you know, performance star not necessarily meeting. Some principals are worried that they are never going to be able to up because of the, you know, if you're in middle school and you test well and you're able to get into a selective high school, then that leads to a lot of students who don't test well in other high schools, right? So I guess that is just something I want to put out there that especially for a comprehensive high school who wants a star rating is something that comes with a lot of things that you have to deal with. And I, I'm hoping that 
I guess I guess my question though is is that something that if you talked about or thought about as you develop the infrastructure that would speak to something? Or is, are are there other ways that you're addressing that issue um, at the high school level in particular? Sorry, if you want me to answer or yeah, why don't you wait. respond to this to him <laughs> <laughs> It's not another question, I promise. But, 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 but I think, but I think to that point, right? And I've, I've said it over and over again. There was, I think, an abnormal exodus, right, from, right, at least my comprehensive high schools in my ward, right, that might may or may not have been related to their star rating, but it was abnormal, right, tremendously abnormal. And so, really tracking those trends and, and intentionally finding ways to make sure that something that's designed constructively. No, because what I wanted to raise is sort of in the same ballpark, which is a number of, I mean, 74 had an article, there's been some articles, you know, in the DC press about um, when you have these stars, and I guess there's a big story about great cities, that when you raise schools, there is, there is a tendency um, to create more segregation because you, you, you get people, I think this was sort of um, what Frazier was saying is that most people think if it's the five star, that should be better, and so that's what people do, and it leads to some more segregation. And so one of the articles around this, I think this one maybe was in the 74, was a recommendation, I think somebody turned it into a campaign, to really encourage parents alongside of the stars, whatever they're in with, go see two schools with a set of questions about, here's ways that you could go to a school, and you could understand what's going on there that may not be reflected in the stars because the stars look at these things and they don't look at these things. And I wonder, I mean, I was looking at the parent guide that you have, I wonder if that might be a way to try to uh, incorporate some of this. So can I also just call a thing out for our, my, for our colleagues? The great schools rating is crowdsourced, right? So, so they, they have their own algorithm and then the comments are crowdsourced. That is much different than our rating system, which is a state accountability system which this body endorsed and, and adopted, and it's not the same thing. So I do want to just draw a clear line between the difference between systems that seek to create popular options for parents to look at versus state accountability systems. Fair enough, but the point I'm making is that across both kinds, there is a tendency, and there have been uh, reports on this, articles on this, there's a tendency for the consumers to see the stars or the numbers and make choices on that. And so the idea is how do we, as educators, as people on the board in Aussie, help people see what's really going on that may or may not be captured in that, in that story. You know, and so I think it's, <laughs> oh. <laughs> they're, all, they're all sort of around the same thing, is how can we help parents with this? Um, I just wanted to say we are looking forward for a commitment in our interest to bringing growth um, presentation of, of possibilities for growth and changing the high school framework um, later this year. So I think that a lot of this conversation we will be able to um, have real tactical conversations with. Um, as we talked about when we passed the, the STAR framework, that we always did want to grow. It's very hard, complicated, and hard to do mathematically, but we are committed to it and we're moving forward on that path. So we're looking forward to actually sharing that and then having some actual tactical conversations about, you know, how to weight uh, growth, um, as well as other, you know, as well as reshifting the weights from the other measures that are currently there, and and we will provide as robust analysis as we can about how those things interact with each other and what they reflect. Um, high school actually has a very large number of metrics in it, so it's interesting to be looking at those about access to um, to different curricular options, about um, not um, about graduation. Um, and, and, and other things like that that obviously are not relevant for elementary. And so we'll have some, we'll have some really specific conversations like that coming. And so I think that, um, so that, that's an answer to like a large number of those questions. I mean, we know from talking to parents, parents take in many, many things into account when choosing schools for their children. Um, and we just, our goal for this framework is to provide common information, transparent information, 
to help parents have a starting place instead of having to know somebody who knows a person who's maybe keeping a spreadsheet or talk with a friend and maybe just go where your friends go or hear about things. Particularly in high school, we know that fit for a particular student's needs, a family's needs, and their interests, um, and the type of education they're interested in getting, the focus of the book, the education they want to have, either in academic areas or in rigor or in stress level or in distance to home or other family obligations are really important and you hear families say that all the time. And that's, um, and what we're hoping is that this is one piece of that puzzle, but a transparent and equitable one. So, um, we're, and we're looking forward to coming later um, in the year with some real sort of nitty gritty conversations about how we can um, make changes. Absolutely. Since we got locked up here, we talked too long. <laughs> um, we are we are close to taking up more of your time than we were allotted for, but we do have science results. You've recently heard a significant amount of this content when we were getting when we were talking about the school setting. So we can go through relatively quickly a bunch of the background, but we wanted to focus on the outcomes of science assessment if you haven't had a chance to review, and then also provide some of the um, support that we're putting in place, particularly every time we talk about how valuable, I know we talk a lot here about how valuable science is, so we want to share like, some of what we're doing to improve um, outcomes for kids. I'll be brief so people can ask questions. Um, so as you know, we administer the Dean Science Assessment that we align to the Generation Science Standards uh, for the first time uh, this spring with the students, and we've heard a lot about the development process, as Sean mentioned. As you know, the required assessments are grade five science, grade eight, and high school biology. And on December 10th, we released statewide results at the school LEA and statewide level um, to the public schools and LEA. So I won't go into this case, you've seen this graphic many times at this point of the kind of rigorous high quality development cycle we've gone, we've um, engaged in over the past two years. Development is ongoing always. So we, we develop new items, we um, with educators every single year. So we're actually doing that for next year now. We report out on four different performance levels. As you saw when we were approving and reviewing cut scores, um, levels three and four represent um, standards that have met or exceeded expectations. So we have two levels below that, partially meeting expectations and approaching The DC Science Assessment is reported on a scale of 300 to 600. That does not overlap with the PARP scale. That's nearly intentional. Separately for an assessment that is designed separately and for a different purpose. If you meet or exceed expectations, you're meeting expectations or exceeding expectations for the standards in that grade. It's limited to that in terms of the length of the assessment and what it's designed to do. Really saying how is your implementation of the standards. So this here is a baseline setting foundation we can draw with sense. The DC Science Assessment measures the we, skills we believe, knowledge that we believe are most critical in the standards that the science is taking and problem solving. We've talked a lot in previous meetings about how do we have this we have a lot of We're not just focusing on content, the kind of disciplinary core ideas, we're talking about the practices, we're talking about cross cutting concepts, do they weave that together? Can they analyze? So this first year, we're establishing a new performance baseline and setting clear expectations. For the first time, really reporting on that um, to schools and to LEAs to say, okay, what does it mean to meet these standards? So it's a word in the year. And given the new rigorous expectations, and you saw some item and standard differences from our previous standards and assessments to now, the results on these sides are lower than the results on our English and math assessments this year, and that's expected. However, uh, we are confident that over time, as we share more and learn more about these standards and the expectations we have, that we will see steady improvements. Uh, as we have seen over the years since we are looking at that. We are going to, we are planning both at all, at all levels, school, LEA, and OSC, to really take a look at this information to help inform our planning and our strategic goals for students. So these are the overall results for DC Science by grade. The orange is a level one, the yellow, level two, light green. the same standard each year, so what we're seeing, because they all go up, is that because just at a higher grade we know more, or are these actually different standards? 
there are different standards. The grade five standards are banned. Oh, I'm sorry, they go banned. I'm sorry, I, 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 I read them wrong. Thank which we would thank you. Which okay. which we would accept. Um, but to your point about different standards, they're not vertically aligned. They are aligned directly with criteria. Um, so we have 18.4% of students meeting or exceeding expectations and standards this year in grade five. Something we talk a lot about are the level three partially, or um, excuse me, level, a level two approaching expectations numbers, which are quite wrong. Um, it's, there's a large percentage of students who are not yet there, um, but that have a pro or approaching expectations, which I do believe is really meaningful. There's a, a big chunk of students that are getting pieces of these standards, but have not yet crossed that threshold. We have a couple other slides to break it down a little further. Okay. Yes, please. Are you looking into it all? You know, we all know that um, what goes on in the assessment has a lot to do with what goes on in the school. Yeah. And I'm just wondering at the high school level, with the, with the test focus on biology and not the other mm -hmm. tests, do you, are you in conversation with the schools? Is someone in conversation? Is that having an effect on the quality and incentive for people to do chemistry and other issues? So we have heard from some schools actually could some schools saying, could you do an assessment in chemistry, an additional assessment here and there that was not consistent across all schools. Um, we have not heard that there's a difference in the high school demand for these courses, particularly given graduation requirements and a more structured approach to science in high school. Um, so we have not heard that yet. I think it's something to certainly keep our eyes and open to. But as we talk to people in, in our wards, we would be interested in their opinions as well. And when we chose biology, it was through engaging the D science. Uh, past course of LEAs uh, to determine what course we chose, and they did unanimously. We were able to decide on biology at the appropriate course. So here we're looking at the different major student groups where we're seeing for degrees, significant gaps, um, where there's a lot of work to be done. We did see significant gaps of this nature the first year of ELA and math as well, uh, and seeing some significant improvement, not improvement that, that we'd like to see over time. Certainly, we have seen improvement over the years in LA and Mountain saw pretty um, comparable distribution of significant growth in this area for uh, our major student groups. We also split it by race and ethnicity as well. Well, when I noticed you pulled out the homes, we report typically on. Because at one point, you know, we had, we had asked you guys in a resolution to disaggregate the at risk so that we could look at the SNAP and the homeless and the community. So now you're doing the homeless. What would it take to get the others? I don't think that's really possible. We can talk about it another time. Okay. I mean, this is, it's very helpful. It's really interesting to be able to see the track and it keeps people focused on the We typically limit to the larger groups, and, and uh, there are some additional restrictions. It, it would be on the data files. Um, and even if we can see, we don't include everything here. We can include the other ones. And two, it tracks pretty closely the homeless student results, track pretty closely the average student results. Is that true in the other subject? I'd have to check. I, I don't know. So here you can see the, uh, the distribution uh, by race and so. ethnicity. Even more significant differences yeah. between race and ethnic groups in science than yeah. that in any of our <coughs> charts, which is, of course, like very, very concerning. Mm -hmm. um, as we talk about what that means for the access to curriculum um, or quality of the curriculum that other people, that the, the students are getting mm -hmm. in school. So it's certainly we want to leave it unremarked on. It's yes. significantly, yeah, it's significantly different than um, the right. graphs we see in, in the math. So I, I want to make sure that it is curriculum, not simply just time. Um, you know, we have some some basic standards for time that students are supposed to take in science, and do the schools have 
facilities even to have a science course. Um, and what's the difference between a science course that is hands on and one that's just textbook? Um, I'm really glad that we're doing this type of research and looking at this because I think for most disadvantaged students, science is super important. We've got climate change, we've got folks that really aren't, that don't think that facts matter, and, and they do. And, and I'm really happy. was really one of the most meaningful discussions on this and I've referred people back to it a couple of times to find the, the video or the audio um, on your site because I think that what the educators have to say about this was probably the most robust discussion that people have had publicly about science instruction in a while. Um, so related to, you know, uh, wanting to have more time spent on it, whether or not it's materials or not, just the, the, the emphasis on it and science to providing more community of practice and more engagement and Really meaningful. So I, I think everybody knew what that meaning, but if not, I'd encourage you guys to go back and then send it to other people and you can watch it. That's what I was thinking about when you were talking about this. Mm -hmm. Because we've got this, and that was even when we had the panel on social studies too, it was just like that. You know, all these faculty teachers who want to be able to do it, but uh, their hands are tied behind their back kind of thing. And uh, because I, I don't science person uh, when, uh, when I was in school, but uh, how, how, do we, how do we move the scores up? Because like biology is given in the 10th grade, right? And uh, if they're not taking science in the 9th grade, you know what I mean? Well, we've heard that from our, from our biology educators who work on the development side, that's something that oftentimes students are coming from such significant gaps, that while they have often the resources, they have the resources have the time allocated, you're covering such significant gaps right. of time. So really to start is a, is a full um, breadth conversation of talking about implementing standards. And, um, because I can't, I, with English it's kind of different, but with, with science and math, if you don't, if you don't have the, the base when you're taking a test, the scores aren't going to change if a fifth grader's taking something and it's the first time they're taking a science test. I can't see how the scores will change the next year if it hasn't been resolved in the fourth grade. Well, we're, so we're hoping that this type of conversation and sharing of information and the support we're going to talk about a little bit later is to help spark additional conversations sure. um, at all levels about what does it mean to focus on science and science instruction. Um, there's no silver bullet to it for sure, um, but a deeper focus on standards, the appropriate time and and then communities of practice can all contribute to our deeper understanding of, of and commitment to science instruction. I think when, when OSI, if you look at OSI strategically and in one of our pillars is setting high standards and the other is high quality and ethical data, this is really what we're talking about, right? We set a standard that we know we want students to know and be able to do these things. We put data out so that everybody understands where we are and what we need to do, and then we can focus our resources around those areas that are the most important. And that that's going to be our educators and our kids with starting from the beginning, but you know, when we did this with um, English and math assessments, you know, we said here's where we want to get to, and we have been making progress towards that goal. And so we have every faith in our system and in the people who are working in it that we can get there. It's just gonna take a bunch of work, you know, a bunch of more conversations with this. And that's what we want to tell you all with when we go talk to schools and same with us to say, okay, like what are we on the look for to help any teachers get they need in this one more. So want to talk a brief little bit about some of the resources. Uh, we did release on December 10th a uh, PowerPoint presentation that has a little more depth than this. Um, school LEA level with results and state level results and multiple data files similar to what we see for daily math, performance participation. We have a special file on student disabilities as well, which is adding deeper to that as part of our commitment. We also release sample individual student reports and parent guides available in multiple translations. Those will also ship directly to schools. Um, hopefully. Hopefully at this point, all students have them in their hands. Um, and we also had um, secure information sent to LEA principals as well for all of our students. 
and um, the immigrant who helps post it on their report card. One thing we don't in the future of the school report, um, you can see the consistency across the LA, I'm not using it before, um, so if you're a parent, you really have an ability to look across and um, share some of those learnings you've had as you've, you've seen score reports for the LA and math over time. Something that's not on here that I have raised before is the fact that we also have a number of additional resources for our schools, for our educators, such as the fully functional online practice test that actually has four We're actually refreshing it this year with even more items than some of the more advanced accommodations, um, Spanish versions, written speech, things of that nature. And we're really excited about that because it's pretty rare to have a fully functional practice test and we try to encourage people so the more communication you can do about the fact that we try to really share what our students and expectations look like, the better. Over time we'll release items, but it's so new that right now we're really focusing on the practice test. Yeah. Sorry. English language learner. Uh, yeah. You said there's a now, is there a Spanish version of it? Mm -hmm. There is. Is there an art version of the test? There is not. Um, we have, you are able to have translated directions in your native language by an administrator. Um, that is true for math as well. Uh, we are not able at this point to have full translations of any language that. Um, you said with an administrator? The directions can be Does it have to be an administrator to give the directions? There are, we have policy rules. The administrator doesn't mean like not principal, it just means somebody who administered the test who yes. certified it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just can't be your parent. No answer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No. Um, and we have similar accommodations, uh, policies across our English math and science assessments, such as where you're able to get a book of dictionary, etc. Um, and other things that we provided just support wise just like helpful for you to know is that we provide performance level descriptors that we share with all of you. But uh, before they come this year, we're going to be providing performance Every single performance expectation on the assessment, not just the high level kind of communications information, but at the P, the performance, you think of it as a standard level, or every standard that's assessed for educators to help better um, unpack the standards. And that's something you know, unusual for an assessment, which we thought was really important to share more information on the standard side and how that connects to the So, Danielle, for example, that means that for XYZ standard of the grade, Teachers would essentially have almost like an exemplar of what this should look like for a student. It's not sample work, but it's what would a level four expectation, level three, level two, level one for that standard. So a lot of work went into that, and actually educators are coming in in a couple of weeks to take a look at it. So we're really excited about that, um, that investment into trying to help people better understand standards. That's the, from our locus of control and the assessment team, what we can help you is help people better understand. So we're excited about that work. And are those sample items with those different level answers? They're standards. So they're sample, there's practice they items. They're connected to the standards. Mm -hmm. We don't give an exemplar answer for every question. Mm -hmm. We say, here's like what, here's what a kid would do to get a meets expectation yeah. on the standards. They would be able to show this, make this, draw a graph of this, like, yeah. mention this type of thing. So over time, we'd love to connect that to release items as well. Mm -hmm. That's a set. We need to go to release items, so we're sorry. <laughs> we're not there yet. But we're excited about that type of assessment. We also wanted to highlight some of the work that the teaching and learning team at Aussie is doing with respect to science. Um, their science team does a lot of different webinars and sessions and cohort work on science. Um, they have a standards page where they talk a little bit more about that. Over the next couple months, there are a lot of opportunities for professional development. We've been trying to share this really broadly. We have an NGSS summit on the 27th, where we're bringing together all the educators and LEA folks to talk about issues, critical issues in science. Um, and these are just a couple examples of the type of training and professional development Aussie is committed to as we think about it, additional implementation of those elements. We also have a special program in environmental literacy. Um, we have those folks who partner in development and assessment as well. Do you want to share those? And we also encourage uh, school educators as well as curriculum leads to partner with us in developing the assessment itself. We talked about item reviews, performance expectation reviews, they will participate in the performance level setting, standard setting, and that is ongoing. So we actually have a number of opportunities over the next couple months that we've been really pushing to our educators to participate in. We've had a wonderful group of educators, but it will always be bigger. Um, and kind of the same folks that get excited want to do every single one, but we would 
Mogadishu. Thank you uh, for sharing and being patient with us and making what could have been probably a 30 minute presentation much longer. Uh, I guess I have a general overarching question between both the star data points and the science in that what, how does OXY see its role relative to LEAs? And this kind of connects to Ashley's question earlier around like the development piece. And so yes, we have our stars, yes, schools are moving up and down. I guess my question is for those schools that have our N1, have stayed at one, and or those students and schools that have low science scores, it would just be helpful for me to be clear on Ossie's role and supporting schools and making improvements. And I'll just throw out my general understanding, at least for the STAR frame, the STAR uh, supports is that it's more of a direct LEA responsibility to support schools, yet Ossie still has extra benefits, whether that's the financial or the professional learning opportunities. I just want to make sure I'm clear or accurate in that assumption, or if you have anything more. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question, and this comes to our role and your role as state agencies, right? Um, and so mo many of the things that we think are the most um, directly impactful in student outcomes in a day-to-day -day basis are LEA or school-level supports. Um, we want to um, set the standards for those things that we think everybody should be reaching. Sometimes um, sort of enforce a report on those standards, depending on what we're talking about with assessment and with data. Make data available so that we can push and nudge people to do the right thing. Um, build the ecosystem of our community so that individual LEAs in schools are better able to make their own improvements. Um, and, um, and things like curriculum are not in our space, although we do, you know, there may be things in the future to say, like, here's examples of good things, or talk to each other about these things, or here's a school that's doing well, talk to them about what they're doing, that kind of matchmaking, highlighting, um, et cetera. Um, and we do want to provide high quality national supports as well to schools that, um, and or LEAs, that, um, that want to take advantage of those things in the areas that we feel are most important, to dedicate our resources that is most. We do not want to be prohibitive of LEA work um, and or get down with the nitty gritty of you know, personnel and, and curriculum and what a teacher is teaching every day. That's not our role, but there's lots of places that we can provide um, uh, training and professional development and, and, and links to other people to show what is working and how to help people to improve. Um, you know, as with statewide accountability, like there are specific levels of accountability where we say, school is not working, you need to submit a plan to us about what you're going to do, we're going to publish it, we're going to share your progress, that level of intervention, which is the same thing we did with our exit plan, and also support, right, intervention and support, we're going to give you $11 million to the school, but in exchange, you need to put a square with your kids, et cetera. Um, so it is that balance school. That is my understanding, that's a subset of schools. That is a subset of schools, right. Um, and then, you know, again, balanced across both district and charter, but different ways of operating, and so we attempt to do all of those things in ways that are the most responsive and responsible for navigating a system, as we know, that's complex with um, a large traditional district and a charter district with you know, nearly 70 individual operated LEAs. Is. I'm going to turn my head from you for a second to try and um, go back to the slide. So yes, in the way that the star rating works is that for each, there's a framework for elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools. Each have different uh, uh, metrics in them that we measure, and in each of those frameworks, elementary, middle, high, they have they are measured, they are weighted differently. It's hard to see anyway. But essentially, and then in addition to um, what is in each of those sort of buckets of um, achievement, growth, uh, achievement of English proficiency for non English learners, um, increased school graduate and graduate and school environment, um, we 
calculate that for all the students in the school and then also for the specific groups of students in the school. So we can see now we're not how all students doing, but how are, for example, students with disabilities doing compared to other students with disabilities. So we get a sense for every school, um, not just the, like the all and sort of high percentage of individual groups, but we get all of those pieces of information. So each of those things are weighted. Um, but just to clarify, for every school, it's weighted the same way. That's one of the primary um, values and reasons for like a statewide accountability system is that like, you know, um, two different high schools don't get to choose the thing that they want in their group, right? So every school gets the same, but each type of school gets something of, gets like a slightly different weight depending on what we're looking for. So like, By law, in, uh, by law in federal law, student achievement has to be weighted more. But in our system, when we uh, designed it together a couple of years ago, growth is weighted higher than just proficiency. Because growth is just precedent over just the score of the like, proficiency. Um, so that's the Likely, I'm just saying it's they're not being compared to each other in these ages, right? So it's not like if one's one, it's not a normal curve. It is, it is not a normalized curve every year, but there are parts of the system that do compare schools to each other in the way that it is calculated. Um, so will there always be schools that are, will one school going up? No, not necessarily one-to-one -one in that way. I mean, I, I think yeah. they're one, it would be like the non-substantive things that could this occur between yeah. the It's, it's slightly more complicated than that. I think one moving up does not necessarily move another down in that way like in the summative rating. Mm -hmm. So one up does not equal one down, as we saw, because we saw all the, the, the ratings, which are derived from the scores, shift over time to improve. But I'm just saying that there are specific kinds of metrics the original score was based on how schools compared to each other. For example, you know, the, the floor to get any points at all was 10th per percentile, and the target was the 90th percentile. So that does, I, I just don't. It's used in a necessary way, but right? it's not to say that. Yeah, it's, it's not tied every year to a normalized curve the way really? that your math teacher sets a curve every time you do a test. Right. So I guess my ultimate question is. There's not a pilot period. Right. Okay. It's a real thing, yeah. and it, it, it has made a difference for a number of our schools. So it just it is the first cycle of, of this system. Yeah. Not to be flipped, but um, but uh, after after three years, we will go through a set of standard setting process to to identify how the cycles for the entire year. The PMF does something similar about over time. So um, so we will have. All right. Thank you so much for um, staying for all our questions. Thank you guys. Thanks for the good questions. Sorry to keep you guys. Happy New Year. So members, you received a, a rough draft of the annual report in uh, in your email. We are still making changes and, and all the technical edits to it. That the intention is for this to be on the January 15th meeting um, for adoption so that we have it ready for our performance oversight hearing that's coming up at the end of the month. Um, so if there are any uh, sort of major issues, um, certainly let us know. Um, one thing I do need to point out to some members who have not yet provided quotes we will leave it at Lauren Ibsen if you if you 
you know, who provide us with that. Well, I swear I will. Um, but please do um, uh, provide us with some, some the court information that I believe Elio sent to you, and I'll have her send again. Um, she sends her regrets. She is homesick, battling um, pneumonia and the flu um, after getting married over the holidays. Oh. Um, so she um, she sends her regrets. Oh, Elio. You shouldn't have said that. Um, so she will she will be back as soon as she can. But um, in, in her said, um, we've all been working um, pretty hard on the on the annual report. Um, I do want to specifically call out Caitlin, who is the major designer of the report. It looks amazing. It does. Um, <laughs> she's slowly saying this. Yes. Um, which is exactly why I did that. Um, but uh, so if you do have other questions or additions or things that we, you think we should change, please let us know as soon as possible so that we can get a, um, a final draft to you, um, hopefully by Friday, since that is the deadline for next week's um, and, uh, public meeting. Were there any major issues now? Um, let me give a very brief on it as a brief report, and then we can go to committee reports. Um, so, first, I don't think that we've met, and I may be wrong, since um, the council had a grand table on teacher retention, and Frazier represented us, um, and it was great, and he was at the table with our um, DCPS and the state superintendent, so the charter school. So it was great. He was reading about the goal. Transfer so, and Frazier was, was, was paying his great attention to uh, that whole issue. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, because I think I said this last time, is we are hoping that the teacher uh, turnover legis retention legislation, teacher data warehouse legislation, is going to be presented. Our next public meeting. One thing I wanted to say is, I think everybody was there. We had that um, we did a discussion about homeless students last time, which I think John Paul was trying to work up into uh, a resolution or a letter that we'll send to the council to sort of lay out some of our concerns on this. And a number of us were just over at PCSD um, talking about really to talk with them about what they wanted in their next executive director. But one of the questions put to us was how you could all more joint advocacy, so we, we will share that with them to see if there's a way to connect with them over that issue. Um, and we also talked about the reading, um, and I will tell you a lot of reading people are very, very excited about that um, that session. We're going to have a follow-up to that uh, next week, including DCPS will be participating um, with the director of their reading clinic program, which is sort of their big effort um, to really provide some high quality training. Washington Literacy Center, which provides a lot of tutoring to a lot of our schools, as well as six months. So that's what we have. Where's the reading room? Uh, DCPS. Uh, DCPS. Uh, DCPS. Uh, DCPS. Uh, DCPS. I think we're full up this time, but let's like, give us the info. And, and it's not too important. I mean, the idea here is that we would actually pull together something as a board with a recommendation about how the city could provide the kind of training and education for our board grade teachers. Um, okay, that's really what I want to say. I have a question. Oh, I'm uh, John Paul, I, um, on the, in the bylaws, mm -hmm. uh, the way I read it is that we can have resolutions on rather than serve, serve all the way. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not clear on the question. I mean, we had a conversation about we can, we can only submit serve all the way. According to my reading of the bylaws, we can submit a resolution. Members can submit any type of resolution, yes. I agree. Does it have to do with other than ceremonial? Yes. Um, the, the only difference between ceremony and regular resolutions is ceremonials do not need to be discussed in a working session prior to a vote. We've, we've been having a discussion at the last meeting about 
there's policy resolutions which approve or do not approve policy regulations, there's ceremonial resolutions, and then there's another category which I think you're referring to, you may be referring to, which is what about just the policy statement here? Well, I'm talking about a resolution that has some gravitas as opposed to a ceremonial resolution. So let me, we, there's been a several. The way I read the Bible. So last time we had a, an all over the lot conversation about how to deal with this. And I will, here's sort of where we have landed for the moment, which is, um, I think there's not a lot of consensus about how to handle that. Um, I think for now we should have, continue as we've had, we've had ceremonial resolutions for which you don't need to get, um, you don't need to submit them in advance and presumably they are literally honoring people. They should not have any controversy to do that. They are honoring people and uh, we can then vote on them and assume they get a majority, they pass. Then we have another kind of resolution which is everything else that is both our, the resolutions that deal with our work for ourselves, resolutions that approve uh, awesome policy and resolutions like we had on the first um, mental health support way back in uh, February, I think, that are sort of our views of policy that are not things that we specifically can put into effect, rather there are statements of support that we might send to the council, individuals might use them to say, this is what the board thinks. My own personal view is we shouldn't have a whole lot of these just because it will really take away from our ability to work on things that we want to work on, need to work on, and have greater authority on. But we do, people want to say things on some things, and that will just be a regular resolution. People who want to bring them will bring them, just as they have in the past. Um, and if a majority is for it, it passes as a, as a resolution. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And insofar, so that's part one, that's where we are now. Insofar as people want to really think more about this, uh, we can also take it up as a group. But my own sense is that's sort of where the consensus is. Can we take it up at this meeting? Take it up. I think Ruth is saying that the consensus is still people that do it. Yeah, not to change our resolution structure. We have ceremonial resolutions, and then we have resolutions that we have. Unless, have I'm, unless I'm wrong, though, there isn't anything. Are you looking at it, John Paul? I can pull up the bylaws if you'd like. Where it says, talks about, it doesn't have a definition for a resolution. Correct. The bylaws do not define what uh, what is a single resolution. Now, I'm not trying to make a big deal about it, but I, but I do want it to be addressed because what we talked about last time was, was that we weren't going to change it. And I don't think you would have to change anything because the bylaws state just defines a resolution as a resolution. It doesn't have any kind of... The discussion was that, that we have no authority over several of the resolutions that were, I have no jurisdiction over the several of the resolutions sense. that were coming for the board to the table. But it, there are the bylaws, different... Though. But that was the, what the discussion was, was about. We have certain authority over certain resolutions. Resolutions concerning uh, residency requirements certain things that Aussie brings to the table. The uh, resolutions that we were discussing specifically in December were things that we have no authority over. That's what the discussion was about. Whether we uh, bring them all in a lump sum, which, which is, is, what, which is yeah. what Ruth is saying, or whether we break them out. Because there are certain resolutions that we actually have authority and jurisdiction and a, a, a yeah, the discussion was about whether we keep it as a broad category, whether we just generally narrow the scope of what we define as a resolution that's uh, legitimate before the board, or whether we make room for right for other things, right? But, or we narrow it and make room for those other things in a separate category. I think what we're saying now is that there's really no consensus about where we go that we'll, we'll keep it, but if there's a
that's right. Exactly. So if, if so they're allowed to by law, like I don't, I thought retreats were just for training purposes. They are. Not the board. No, not the board. Yeah. So they, the, we can close the meeting for training, and since this would be um, a professional development exercise in discussing sort of how we would look at things, I think it, it could could be on the agenda for the retreat, but it would need to be structured very carefully to make sure that we are in compliance with open meeting. Um, and I'm happy to talk with the leadership team about how we want, might structure that discussion to make sure that it is in compliance. Okay. So for, just to confirm, that, does that mean that the meeting next week, the two proposed resolutions from December will be on the agenda for us to have a vote? Yes. Or a board member? Right. And am, I, am I right that they, because they came before us in December, and now we're talking about they the meet our requirements. And what I would suggest, and this is only a suggestion, is if there are um, people have concerns with the resolutions that possibly could be handled with the resolution writer, have those conversations, and if not, there'll be a vote. Ceremonial but even with that, I guess I would just prefer to see it. Yeah. yeah, and in fact, I think everybody has. They, they, they go out, they don't. I'm sorry. So there, there is a requirement that they have to be in um, at least a certain number of days prior to the meeting because we have to meet our open meeting requirements. So they do need to be in at least by the Friday before the a meeting in order to meet those requirements. So, but we don't necessarily see them before. Correct. The way we do it now. So. Better that we do get to read the resolution before we get on the diet and have to vote it down or whatever. Well, they are included Friday. in the package. Well, she, yeah. she was, she's talking about before the Friday. Friday. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just FYI, I am going to bring forth the standard national school choice week uh, resolution that we bring forth every year. It's the national week of the school choice week. This one. For as a ceremony. <laughs> This might be a good time to also bring up the Martin Luther King Day Parade and what it is uh, coming up for the citywide parade, hosted in Fred Ward, obviously. Uh, uh, it's happening January 20th. Uh, and uh, and uh, my, my suggestion was that, uh, and I just forgot who I mentioned this to, but that the board participate in some way uh, on the parade day. Uh, and I know that that's a difficult to do staff and things like that, but I know we talked about it. Generally, you can come if you want as members and just kind of be there. But if we wanted to have a contingent in the parade, walk with a banner or something, there's a simple like little dot on the. Yeah. Do we have a like an SBOE flag? No. Like, 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 that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Jackets, jackets, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at it. Look at the banner. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. 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 And to and to also note <laughs> also to note for members of the public, you are welcome to join us at the at the MLK Day Parade. Please feel free to march with the state board. That was great. Love it. Um, do you want me to go to the Yes. All right. Um, executive Director Report. <laughs> Um, so members, in your packet are a couple things that I wanted to um, call attention to. First is the updated 
um, the, uh, upcoming events um, list. Um, that also includes both of our, our performance oversight hearing and our budget hearing. Our performance oversight hearing is the 29th of this month. Um, our performance oversight questions we received just before the holidays. Um, I am working on a draft for those, and I'm hoping that they will be um, completed by next Friday so that you all have a chance to look at them, including the testimony, so that you have a chance to look at it before they have to be submitted the next week to the council. Um, if you do not already have plans to attend, please do. Um, and please also, when you're sending newsletters and in information out, please invite your, t your constituents to also come and testify to talk about the great work that the State Board is doing. We would really appreciate it. Um, it's a great um, opportunity for us to hear from constituents um, before the council. Um, there is a sign-up sheet that is um, run by the Committee of Education, um, and we can send that um, out for you to, to put information on, or you can just retweet us. That is our tweet that's coming out about that um, shortly. Um, the second one is the budget hearing, which will be in March. It's March 23rd. Um, so please also add that to your calendars. Um, if you plan to testify for other agencies, um, performance oversight or budget hearings, please let me know, um, just so that I can make sure to watch and, and cheer you on from, from either here or from there. It would be great. Um, the rest of the performance oversight hearings are already uh, listed on the upcoming events, so you can have those um, with you. Um, at our last meeting, um, uh, Jack asked for a list of all of the committees that um, we have um, as members, as the state board, um, and that's provided as a separate sheet. There are some vacancies that you've seen, some of that are on the list. Some of them are ones that we have not participated in for a while or just don't have anyone currently. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, talk to, to you know, send an email to Ruth and um, we can work on, um, on those types of things. The one that I do want to specifically note is the Everyday Counts Task Force. They have three different subcommittees. I have I have tried to go to, to many of them, but there are some that it would be great to actually have members on that we don't currently have a, a regular member. Um, Ashley has been fantastic in going to the policy committee, if I remember right, or the program. It's the, the larger, the you're larger. Going to steer. It, it's, no, it's no. The, yeah. that's no, different. It's, you're, the, you're on the steering committee the, by statute. Um, and but so, it's a policy program would be if I remember. Well, it's the general meeting. It's right. the, the large general meeting. The steering committee, Ruth, is what you do. It's ahead of the general meeting. Um, it's with Dean himself. And the chairman, um, Chairman Mendelson, um, Council Member Grosso, and, and the chancellor. Yes. And, and chancellor. And the, yeah. I believe the superintendent is also on there as well. Um, but that's that's why why I wanted this. And I also get the data committee yes. information. I get the information. Um, I can certainly disperse it. I get confused in the data committee oh. and go ask me for a decision. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I can I get this information. I'm keeping track of it. I just can't go to all the meetings. Yeah. There are there are not. <laughs> yeah, so um, there, have, there have been some staff changes in the DME's office, and I think some of those things have, um, were dropped and shuffled or whatever, but we have asked for that, those changes. But, but yeah, so if you are interested in, in working on those committees, again, just let Ruth know, and we can um, make sure that the, those are covered. Um, if I have missed any, please also let me know, and I intend to keep this as a sort of running list for everyone. Um, so that we continue to make sure that we're represented on these on these committees. And I really appreciate, Jack, sorry, I took care of, um, the, the reminder about the military compact, um, which is one that we don't have an official seat on, but we have had a seat in the past um, provided. Um, the, the DME has, has um, previous DMEs have uh, um, allowed us to participate in that, and so I've asked again for us to be re-added to that, which is a really important. Um, yeah, it, it's super important for military families.
a lot of these students are coming in midway through the school year, or exiting midway through the school year, and tracking data and tracking the students and making sure that um, LEAs were set up to invite the students in and make that seamless and, and make sure that there was room in those schools for more military um, students to be able to get into their school to vote for their for their school right. I really appreciate that, and I'd love to. Uh, if that we're still on that committee or on that board, I'd love to go and uh, at least listen in uh, to what they're saying. Um, something personally that I've been invested in and uh, piggybacks off that is uh, foreign service officers. There has been a number of families in the foreign service who have come to me asking to see what we can do because we deal with residency requirements. The military has residency requirements where if uh, they get orders and they're shipped abroad, they're allowed to stay in the lottery at the school that they were in uh, before leaving DC. That is not the same, that's not true for foreign service. And what I would like to do uh, personally is see how we can navigate that to uh, perhaps change the uh, designation for our foreign service. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's just bringing that up at, this, at one of these meetings yeah. at some point and just say, can we normalize this practice and have for service members and, and their families and people for foreign service? So. I would say too, I got an email from a constituent recently introducing me to, and I'm going to through on this as well, introducing me to a um, military officer uh, about this issue that for families who are getting first time orders to DC, mm -hmm. they are not given that opportunity to enter the world. Like, there's no uh, way to enroll in a school of choice. Okay, yes. Yeah. And, that and so actually, thinking about how we accommodate those families as well. Okay, uh, that would be great if you could uh, well, you get uh, that information. I would be personally interested in that. And I was actually pointing you not to that, but oh, I'll okay. say that um, you know, Jessica brought um, the person who talked to us about the selective service. And that has, yeah, and he is now brought to the council and it's going to become part of his, either his cast or it's going to be cast. It's going to be just introduced. But so we should know that's a way, you know, it's a way to handle these things. It's, um, so it sounds like you've got a vehicle for that to handle these two issues, but we should remember this. There's this body yet. Yeah. 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 And I'll just say in terms of the, the research practice partnership, it's not, it doesn't exist yet. Yeah. Um, so the other thing I wanted to update members on related to um, school visits, um, we had troubles in the fall um, scheduling school visits, and so we, we had to shift some of those to the spring. Um, and um, Capital City Trinidad and um, is is next on our list, as well as the Department of Corrections uh, for their educational facility. Um, I'm working on final dates for that, but um, hopefully they will be in the next couple of weeks. Um, so just. We will update you as soon as we know the dates, and and some of those are um, dependent on those agencies to pick dates rather than us. So it may not work for everyone. I apologize for that, but we will try to get those on the calendar as quickly as we can. Um, just with timing, um, we're looking at the next Making an effort to, to sort of follow all of the different um, schedules, mm -hmm. and uh, for um, corrections, I don't have any date or times that, that are even um, offered yet, um, and the same for Trinidad. But as soon as we get them, we will we will try to accommodate as many members as we possibly can. I appreciate it. Yeah. I would love to attend as many as possible. Yeah. I have a, um, question there. It's just a suggestion for the activities. You know, when we can go, I take. Um, well, actually, that's a fantastic um, uh, uh, segue. Um, members, as, as you'll recall, one of the things that we would like is for members to write blog posts about all their school visits. So feel free to, to go back to your notes and write a blog post, because we would love to be able to publish that. Yes, and. <laughs> yes, and. But yes, the notes would be super helpful. I just think it would be good to put together um, maybe.
there was, and I think we can follow on a bit to the end of the systematically asking and answers to a set of questions. And I think that would also be great to sort of be do that series. And then we have at the end we have right. a yeah. set of information. Well, that's what I can think we had a group we had a group that came together to put together a list of questions, right? And we had the so yeah, the that. no no it it exists. <laughs> but no but you know, we even well, had them. People aren't, none of us are being systematic about it, but we should be. Right, and then, so, so like, if, you know, I had asked maybe three of the questions on the list we had last time, and I assume some of the last other questions that we put together ostensibly was the point of this vision. Mm -hmm. It's to be a study of systematic history and have some things that, that were, yes, we'll take takeaways, right? So, anyway, I don't know where we go with that. Well, we have a scattered list. Well, I'm going to make a note that we need to have some conversation about how to follow up these things. We started last year, we had a couple visits, and then we had a, a lag, and we need to regroup on exactly how we're going to do it and make sure that we collect it. And, and then we'll be able to turn it into something. And then we can use, make use, also think about how to pull in um, reports from, from members who are in one place. I mean, there may be a way to, and the point is to be able to convey our experiences and our findings and our recommendations in some way. Yeah, yeah but the point was that there's a high growth school. Yes. So even if it's like a year for the school that you've already visited, it could be rolled up into some type of, I don't know, uh, report, resolution. Yeah, I mean, like the all-star, that idea, not, not that fancy, but something that contains the findings and the recommendations. And I, would, I would have been that it wasn't fully high growth school. I grow school every other year at all of every, other, every other month. Every other month, I'm sorry. And then on the other six months, just making sure we get to every single board. Okay. Yeah. That's it for me. All right. Um, all right. Um, okay, committee reports. Um, I will just call, I will call committees and people Uh, yes, Alex. Uh, one thing, Alex uh, was uh, away the last time we met, which was he was in Denver, and uh, it's, uh, everything's working really well with Alex. Um, I think the biggest update is on the teacher departure survey. Um, as many of you know, we've contracted with the vendor who is helping us administer that survey. The survey was launched on December 30th, um, so it is live. Um, it has been sent out to, I think, as of Sunday, about 400 emails. Um, so we have just over 100 responses already right. in less than a week's time, um, which is very good. Um, I actually think the response rate is almost 35%, which for a survey is incredibly high. Might be some interest in this. Do you um, I could check on that. One of the interesting things is uh, the vendors indicated that he's sending it both via email and using text messaging, um, and that most people are opening and responding via text messaging. Um, so that's the, it's been targeted 400. I think um, when we met with the vendor initially, his target pool was, he said 250 respondents would be ideal. Um, and so you have two weeks left. And so the survey closes at the end of next week. Um, as of right now, that email text message is inclusive of 
the DC public schools um, and those exited teachers. So that list was procured successfully, and the data was transmitted um, via data sharing agreements. Um, and then it's also inclusive of, inclusive of three charter schools, um, and I think there are six outstanding charter schools that are also agreed to participate, and we're just in different stages with them. Um, and so we will keep everybody updated, but I think the big takeaway is that in a short period of time, especially recognizing there's a holiday in there, the response rate has been pretty high, and I think that speaks to the work of this body and also Frazier's testimony and kind of where we are with it. Um, and I'm happy to answer any other questions. So somebody saying they hope So, so the vendor indicated that they are paying people twice a week. And so once exactly once someone's responded, then they're dropped off, but they're being paid twice a week. I just will also say to everybody, so we want we'd love to have more charter schools involved in this. And it's just harder to do because it's so decentralized. So anybody who has a charter school that they can reach out to, even if you've already reached out to it. It would be great to um, connect with Alex and see if your school is in there, because I know a lot of you did reach out, see if that school participated, and if not, try to get that. And let them know, people would like to open it. You know, it's, it's amazing. What did you say? Did you guys talk to Rick about it? Um, he, what did you say? Well, we talked about it future-oriented, that in the future we would do, um, we talked about what we had done, what we want to do more, but I think you're right. I think it would be a conversation we had with Rick today. But Scott did email yeah. out all the yeah. 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 and then we followed up. And there are some, I just encourage folks to follow up on everything Ruth said, but to follow up and make sure that the LEA hasn't given a definitive no before we, we ask again. Because there are a few LEAs that, so Ward 6 has a number of the large CMOs in it, and there's at least one large CMO that gave a definitive no. So, Alex, do you, is there a way to just easily get that information out to people? Just if you want to. Well, we just want to. So what I could share with you all is um, after tomorrow I'll share with you the list of charter schools that we are in communication with that are, are have said yes that we're working with them on data sharing things. The couple that have given us definitive no's. And then what I would say is if you notice that there's a charter school that's missing on that list, um, and again this is a short list, um, if you have a really strong relationship maybe with that charter school leader, please connect me with that charter school leader, um, and I can work with them and our vendor to make sure that um, they understand the project, the scope of work, how a list of exited teachers would be shared with the vendor, not with us, what the results would are being used for, um, but that would be very helpful. And since we didn't really have any idea what we were doing as far as results are concerned, the, the, the responses that we've gotten are just Almost have a representative number of respondees now that we can get some valid information. I mean, I think the vendor said he's like, if there's under 100 respondents to the survey, then like that's not good. Um, and so the fact that in like four days, which there are already over 100 responses, um, and only 400 emails went out, and I think he said of that, only 350 of those email addresses were valid. I mean, that is an Incredibly high response rate in four days. So, we could, but we can still, if we can add new charter schools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah, I think ideally if we can add new charter schools, doing so and getting that information before the end of this week would be ideal. Um, I'll send an email first thing tomorrow morning about ways to, um, I'll, because the survey is only open until the end of next week, because the next steps of this process are uh, the vendor is going to be convening focus groups with individuals as well as structured interviews. Uh, again, another really, another really good insight is that um, in the survey there's a part for people to opt in to those structured interviews and focus groups. And as of Sunday, almost 50 people have said they're willing to do focus group. And almost 75 people have said they would be willing to do a structured interview. 
And so these are really terrific numbers, and there are people out there that want to talk about this and share their stories. So, uh, yes. And they, they get paid. But, but, and then they have something to do with it. That's good. That was good. Defender. 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 Defender is offering this. Defender yeah. offering right. It has nothing to do with, with us. Right. All right. Um, social science. Thank you, Alex and Tricia. That was that's very exciting. Uh, now we're excited. Now we're going to be excited as a short. <laughs> I'm always very excited. It's not been a long day at all. Um, so, <laughs> social study standards. I sent an email out to the committee members again, CCing folks who are not on the committee, but making sure you're kept abreast of the plans for um, meeting dates over the next six months. So, so people will be getting their calendar now. Then they can be noticed. And if we find we don't need a meeting, we can always take it off the agenda. Um, we did get one, you'll see it's on our events calendar, already set for January. That's the January meeting on the 27th at noon. It'll follow immediately the Well-Rounded Education Committee. Uh, Emily's great Google poll that she sent out for that showed that folks on that committee were available for a big chunk of time. So I just took the liberty of taking the rest of that time from you. Um, for the other dates, I sent out a second uh, email because I know finding times for us to meet is not easy. Um, I have taken all Wednesdays to do state board stuff, so I offered Wednesdays. I know there are a couple of folks who have different time restrictions. Um, if 11 a.m. is possible for folks, that would help meet some folks' time needs. Um, I had originally said 9 and then shifted it to 11. So just please let me know by Friday so that we can get those on the next calendar of events that everyone gets, um, and then we can all put it on our calendars for now and start to plan our work accordingly. The meeting right before the holidays that I had with Aussie. John Paul and I participated in a meeting with Shauna and Justin from Aussie just to do a little discussion around where our committee has worked so far and what we accomplished. Um, and the next step, specifically around an advisory committee. I will say a lot of that meeting was sort of level setting and discussion with Aussie about what role they will play, what role we'll play, um, and then setting up some expectations that they hope we'll take on with the advisory committee. Um, I'll talk more about that with the committee in detail because I'm not sure I agree with all of the things they brought to light, um, but there are some points that I think make good sense and others that I would hope the committee could discuss, decide, and, and bring back to Aussie for, for their decision. Um, what I did say is that at our next committee meeting in January, we would talk in depth about the advisory committee and following that have another call with Aussie that we then move into some guiding principles for what our goals are with the standards review and revision what the advisory committee's role will be vis-a-vis -vis the writing committee, uh, the writing group that Aussie would convene. Um, and then we'll move on to planning public engagement. And the goal would be to start planning that public engagement in April. We're beginning to roll out late in the spring, over the summer, um, and, and moving forward. And we talked about various different ways um, in that conversation with Aussie that public engagement might look. That it might be some online surveys, that it might be some opportunities for further testimony with SBOE, that it might be some board-based events, and all of that I think will be discussion within the committee and then brought back to the full board um, from there. Any questions I can answer? Just a comment, the uh, panels that we had were just fabulous. And uh, I, 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 a couple of people even watched some of them. And they, <laughs> no, I, you, you understand, what, all these people that I talked to who watched them, <laughs> but they were, they like, were we weren't really social studies people, but really enjoyed uh, the conversations that we had. And, and I, I, I think that's one of our uh, real, really good roles, is, is, is we're, we get some great panels. Yeah. You give a perfect segue into the nugget I was saving the best for last for the meeting with Asi about. As we talked about the opportunities and challenges of the work of reviewing and revising standards, the big opportunity that we all agreed on in that conversation was the opportunity to build an educator cadre similar to the science standards group that was built and to really harness and give opportunities for continued professionalization of our teachers in DC schools, specifically aligning to our work on teacher retention. Like all of this should knit together really neatly to say, as we think about the reasons that teachers may not stay, how do we offer opportunities in response to reasons to stay, to become teacher leaders in your field, in your subject area, and how do we as a state board take a leadership effort in making those kind of things possible. And so that was really exciting that Aussie was excited as well about the ways we're going to involve our teachers um, in the work of these standards. And 
both and both of the panels, the science and the social studies panel, you know, here you have these fabulous educators who are doing everything that they do as teachers yeah. that have nothing to do with what sometimes going on in the classroom. And they, they want to teach. Yep. And they got and they're so engaged and everything like we can't afford to lose any of those people. Correct. And so it's a nice opportunity to make sure that we keep opening new doors right. to keep those folks coming. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing folks in the front side. Awesome. Thank you. Um, questions? Uh, Emily, well rounded. Yes. And, and, and it should also be time for you to talk about what's Yes. Um, so can I just give you a question as a just piece of this? Um, the art is out. Uh, we are waiting to hear back um, from vendors. Uh, I guess you're actually. So, so basically all of the research projects are in motion except for the final one which is the uh, sort of the research review on um, quality measures and we were going to meet in December and then I couldn't come. So I'm now thinking maybe I'll, is it too much to tag the research meeting on to the other two? Can we bring sort of where they started or whatever? So I'll go check. Maybe, maybe, yeah. Yeah. Or maybe it's too much. We'll check and see if we can do it. Um, um, I just add one more thing. I'm yeah. sorry. I forgot to mention, um, but just something that just reminded me that I would suggest having a panel for the well rounded education uh, for some time in December. Um, I'm just So, um, so we'll come together for that. One of the one of the reasons I delayed it, just um, so you know, is we've been having these these various issues about how can we contract research in a way that gets good research when we're using these rules that are from uh, the Office of Contracting, Office of Contracting and Procurement, which are, as John Paul has been explaining to you, they're mainly made for things that are more physical. And we've been trying to figure out how to kind of circle this square, square this circle. And uh, Paul's been trying, and in um, sort of for, as a consequence of his trying to make me go to one of the OCP seminars for half a day, so I now know more about it. Anyway, we're we're trying to work that through, including with, with OCP to try to think of some other ways um, that we can engage some of the research at the outset in ways that are legitimate, so that we're bringing in some knowledge. So that we can use that knowledge to create for education support. So we're we're working through that in a bit. And, uh, that's that's the committee. Okay. Anything else? Anything? Um. All right. New business. 
Um, so I wanted to go through quickly what the process will be for the um, leadership election on January 15th, um, because it is going to be a little bit different than our, than our typical meetings. Um, when you arrive at the meeting, um, you, the chair order will be a little bit different, um, because uh, the dean of the, of the state board, Jack, will be uh, in the chair to gavel the meeting in, declare a quorum, and then move to the leadership elections. Um, nominations will be taken then. Nominations for leadership uh, for the president vote will happen first. You do not need a second for a nomination. Um, so once someone is nominated, they will, um, Jack will ask them if they accept the nomination. And then once that is completed, we can move to a vote for a president. Once the president is selected, then um, the, the president will take that seat and leave the, um, the election for the vice president. And once this is going through the same process, once that is completed, then we will move on to the, to the regular section of our agenda. So I just want to make sure everyone was clear on sort of how the process will work. And then do you, so and this is also time that if we Sure, as, as I said in, in the email speaking, um, uh, if, if members want to today talk about their interest in serving, um, you are welcome to do so. You do not have to do so. Um, it is not a requirement or anything, but if, if members would like to talk about their interest in, in one or both or one of the roles, that would be fine at this time. Cool. Well, I'll, sure. I'll just um, no, seriously, what I want to say is when we started this process a year ago, I mean, the reality is that we don't agree on everything in this room, and nor should we. We are sent here by the voters. We're not sent here to always agree with each other. Um, and we've had both productive conversations and discussions and some that are less productive. But I think we've, you know, we've worked together. And what I think is great is that in the end, um, we were able to come together unanimously around a set of priorities around a set of projects, around a um, uh, proposal for some legislation that is now in city council on uh, teacher retention. So I feel like we've made um, good progress. And I, and I want to say thanks to everybody, because the reason they're unanimous is because everybody participated in lots of different ways. I mean, I, I'm just looking around. I mean, there are people here that sort of ran, sort of you know, tried to figure out where's the compromise across people. There are people that did that. There's people on both sides of every one of these resolutions that sort of gained ground and said, okay, I can live with that or I can't live with this. And and we all came together and in the end they all supported it. And I'm very appreciative of that. It took, I know, a lot of time on everybody's part and a lot of conversation. And I think we got to a, you know, a reasonably good place. Nobody loves any of these decisions 100% because we all would have done something a little bit different or a lot of it different if it wasn't 100%. We did it and we're moving forward on that. Um, and I, so let me just say a couple of things about so what I think we've done, the kinds of things I wanted to continue to work on, because I think we're making real progress. I mean, one is around um, the teacher attrition. I want to say that, you know, 15 months ago, before we put out our first report, the first report on this came out under Jack and Karen. And before that, there was no conversation about teacher attrition in the city. And so far as there was any conversation, it was don't worry about it, it's fine. Uh, all that really matters is maintaining, you know, bringing back our highly effective teachers. The rest of it matters. And we've been able to say, no, it does matter. When you have 25, 30, 35% turnover, especially in high poverty schools, it's not okay. And you're not going to get the highly effective teachers if you don't keep them there long enough and train them. And I think it's just had a great effect. Starting back then, all the way through this year, Treasurer's been great. Everybody here has been talking about it. And it's really interesting, you know, now if you read the papers on this, it's always in there. See, it is a fact. It's not even that we get quoted or named. It's just it's a, these are now the facts about teacher retention. And it's a great example of how we can raise the voice of the people in the city. So this is something that we all heard was a big issue and we're, and we're able to do it. Um, there's been the, uh, the round table on it at the council. We're going to get further uh, elevation. Now we're going to have the report survey on it. Uh, and the one other survey, the other, one other recent survey that's not been positive yet is the all teacher survey that went through uh, current teachers on retention as well as other issues. So that's just been great. And the other thing is really trying to play out this idea of one way that we can really 
um, elevated juice for people and help them help the city get discussions on is through research. And it's it's been a learning curve, I will say, both in terms of how we do the contracting, how we get the lists, um, how we work together to come up with the you know, statements of work. But again, everything is in process except for kind of one two for two thing. Um, and I think they're gonna be pretty good. And it's a little bit of a learning curve. I think if we can redo it next year, we'll have we'll just have a lot more knowledge on it. Um, the other thing that is moving forward on that is working with some of the other agencies. I mean it's been uh, as people know who are in on at the beginning, you know, we're trying to bring in DCF, we're trying to bring in the charter board, trying to get the DME and ASA so that these are conversations with everybody about what do we all want to know. And uh, I think we're making headway on it. Um, so we just had some, um, where Marcus and I have been invited to talk um, with the chancellor as part of that list. So I think there's just a movement to um, try to collaborate on these things. So I'm, I'm excited about that, and I would love to be part of uh, bringing it to a greater fruition over the course of the next year with all of So. Um, Also, and I, I do want to mention this, I also take seriously that uh, you know, some members reached out to me uh, with concerns about the time I would have to do this, given some other obligations that I'll have over the next year. Um, but I want everybody in this room to, to be assured that um, when I was elected three years ago, I signed a four-year contract with the voters of Florida. Uh, and that more than anything, I take the responsibilities of the community that trust that I've currently been bestowed uh, more seriously uh, than, than anything I'm pursuing in the future. Uh, and, and I think my diligence as a, as a leader of this body, but also as a member, uh, hopefully the MI speaks to my commitment both to this body, to all of you, uh, but also to the governments I was elected to represent and continue to represent uh, with my full uh, attention uh, over the next uh, you know, I guess six to seven months. Um, and, and, I, and I think, like I said, I think there's a ways to do, but, but I really do believe we've achieved something uh, significant. I think previous leaders of this body had uh, God's work of really making this a body, a body that can function on its own, uh, and it could really achieve the things that statutorily uh, we were meant to do, and I think in so many ways made us a part of the education conversations in the city, and I think we really took the, Ruth and I really taken the baton in that manner, uh, and really thrust us more into the front of those conversations. And I think that's super important. If for no other reason, not only are we influencing legislation, but we're writing it for the first time in this body's history. And I think all of that work uh, is so important. And I think uh, for sure, uh, I can probably speak for Ruth when she was both first and there was like the opportunity uh, to do that work alongside all of you uh, over the next year. So again, thank you for, for the opportunity to speak to you. <laughs> I just like to share something. You know, can I do that? You, you can share with the paper. 
I um, I had no idea what the State Board of Education was when I started running. <laughs> and um, for me, this has been uh, everything that I wanted it to be when I was running for it, as far as not, not being active. So, I mean, because I just didn't know what was going on. And I think that we've accomplished uh, a lot, that there's a lot to be accomplished. And it's a week. And I don't, I feel, I'm just so glad to be uh, among a group of um, people who really care about the kids in this city. Children, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. so, the children. I, know, I, know. <laughs> I forgot, I forgot that. That's a code word for parents. But, uh, yeah, no, <laughs> no, but that's fine. And, but the thing is, is that, is that uh, we, we're not finished yet. So we got to uh, kick some, kick some more for the next few years. Okay. Yeah. Comments? Yeah. I'm not opposed to the continuation of the leadership team. I would, I would ask a couple of, I, I would make a couple of concerns. One, I think it's incumbent upon the leadership team to reach out to all members every month, regardless of whether or not they're getting along, whether or not they agree on issues. But that proactive outreach from the leadership to the members is super important to have the cohesive board. I've not received a phone call from you for six months. And I called you in December and did not receive a call back. In fact, you got an email, you got a text, and you got a voicemail. I don't know. If I didn't get a voicemail. I didn't get a text. Okay. And I'm, if that's just, I, will I, I think it's really important. I, and we can divide and conquer, right? Yeah, Leadership teams can divide and conquer, and they should. If you and I have discretion, then Mark, you can call me. Marcus and I have some friction. And credit, I, I have a few too, so. That, yeah. But I just suggest that that is an improvement that we could make as a leadership team and as individual members. Um, I would also suggest that we need to look at leadership opportunities for everyone who'd like one. I don't think that everyone who would like to have a leadership opportunity has one. And that's problematic. It's also problematic from an equity standpoint when the three three members, four camp actually being at large, from the most disadvantaged wards. Among these four committees that we have, half a person from wards five, seven, eight, and at large have a committee chairmanship. I think that really does not reflect the equity work that we as a team have worked on. I would really encourage us to look at how we select our committee chairs and how we share responsibility and leadership opportunity so that students from all eight wards have have an opportunity to have leaders in us that are invested in their success and that have the opportunity to use their skills. I, I write public policy for a living. I've done that for decades. And I, I think we're, we're fighting without, we're, we're going to battle without all of our soldiers. And I think we need to really take a look at that. Uh, on terms of, Ruth, you said something that, that in your speech just a few minutes ago, which I really appreciated, is that there's a learning curve. And there certainly was when I became president and when Karen became vice president, huge learning curve. But when Karen became president, because she'd been vice president, she did not have nearly a steep learning curve. My concern with Marcus continuing as vice president is what's the succession in 2021? And how, if there's a new president in 2021, is that person going to need to have the same learning curve that will put all of our work back months and months and months for the board that's seated in 2021? I think that's a real problem and something that we need to think about because we've got four brand new members who are really smart, really dedicated, and can will eventually be passed a baton from someone. And I think we really need to take a look at that. And I'm, again, I'm not opposed to the current leadership team. I think we've got to really be reflective over the next seven days, though. Um, and I, I, go ahead. No, no, I, I appreciate all that. And I'll just say, um, well, you can raise it up, hold on. I'm happy to do that, I think, um, for the most part. Uh, and let me just say this to everybody, because I would want everybody to feel this. Um, 
you know, I think we reached out in terms of committees and the working groups and a variety of places to have conversations. And I answer every phone call I get um, and am happy to do so and happy to help everybody try to figure out um, things, you know, needs, solutions to be on it that's not, um, if people feel it hasn't happened for them, I want to Also, and I do want to say, because I've been thinking about it myself in terms of the community group, that part of what happened is as we started, we put somebody, staffers on the SSF, which is a really important committee to be in. And so that's, and then became the co-chair. So, the leadership doesn't have to be committee either, folks. I think we've got this great list that Tom Paul put together. These are all leadership opportunities for us. These are all things that we should be sharing. And I think a little redistribution of our power system it's going to be really important for us to be to reach our peak success. Are we doing well? Sure. Can we do better? Sure. Can we do great? Absolutely. But everybody's got to pull on the water, and and I think we can just all do that. Well, I agree. And so I would encourage people who feel like there's more that they can be putting in to think about the kind of role that you want to play, and let's figure out how to make that happen. And I'm also saying, part of part of what we can talk about. I would just throw out. Just to this point, I would just say. just the three uh, representatives or four representatives if you count Ashley from the neediest areas having more of a platform, but our conversations as an entire board being more grounded in equity, um, to their quite credit, and I don't think this is enough, but I think to start to a conversation at our retreat, we are going to begin to talk about our equity statement, think of it through a lens of a framework and how it connects to our different priorities and work with. I just want to echo that. I do think there is a lot more we can do um, in both representation but also in substance uh, to put forth the importance of equity. Can I ask a question? Do you have a retreat agenda that you know that from? Or is that, where did that come from? No, I, I shared it with Ruth and John Paul um, and Ruth shared that she's going to try and work it in. We're actually, we actually, so people haven't sent ideas in. Some people have for the retreat to do so. I think tomorrow we're going to be sitting down and sort of trying to eventually get some plan. I would, looking at worst case scenarios, I would just make sure that we're, that the agenda contemplates a change of leader. Like that's possible. That the, most, the, the, that the agenda has historically been set by the president. We haven't, we technically have not had a vote on the president yet. We haven't had that vote. So, I, it's not perfectly timed. Sure. I've actually thought about that. Myself. Yeah. And, um, it is what it is. And we it think it's it better just it have it on the schedule yeah. and make sure that we're hitting the ground running in January. And I appreciate that. And, and I know that we will make sure that the agenda that's put together has that flexibility in it. Sure. Um, uh, quick question. Mm -hmm. separate votes. They're separate votes. The board will vote for a president and that the person elected will then move to the president, to the chair's seat and then we will have the election for the vice president. Um, partially because the president is a statutory position and the, and the vice president is a bylaw position. And if a person loses the vote, loses the vote for president, that person is still going to vote for vice president, correct? Correct. All, all elected members are eligible for, for their presidency. Are student representatives eligible for vice president? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a bylaw position. I'd have to look to see if it says elected members, but I think technically they might be because it's not statutory. We've just got some dynamite student representatives, but I'd like us to just keep that in mind. <laughs> the, only problem, the only problem might be Representatives can't vote. 
Elected board members, it is um, considered a continuation of term, even if you're sworn in again. So, I, I mean, they're not, it's not the exact same thing, so I don't know how that would work. But I'll, but I think we, these are solvable problems. Yeah, well, you'll find out. All right, anything else? Any business? Uh, I would just quickly, I've been here on the Facebook page, I have uh, Run, but um, two things. One, I actually, uh, actually, I will not be at next week's board meeting uh, because of a conference that I have to attend. I would like to uh, phone in. I was told by John Paul that I would need to get the blessing of the board to do that, so I am here asking for that blessing. Um, this is a conference that is for my day job that I could not get out of, that I work uh, desperately trying to get out of, but I couldn't. And then, secondly, is the memo uh, that followed the Ward 5 high school tour uh, that I would like uh, to put and vote on the record, uh, to have on the state board record. The reason being is what I've already mentioned that there are folks who watch the state board have access to its materials that I that I don't have reach to, as well as constituents that you all uh, may have in your orbits that tune in that may be of interest. Uh, I am in conversations with Ozzy just trying to get answers to some of these things, in particular the community service requirement. It was news to me that students are saying that community service hours are not transferring between schools. So if I come from a charter and I'm now at a, a DCPS school and I'm in my junior year and now I have to start over and getting 100 hours, that is a barrier to graduation. We can, uh, we can also raise that money. With, um, I thought about it, but I didn't want to put them on the spot. Nor, I'm not sure if these are the right things. I, I didn't want to come. So I, I shared an email. We are in communication. Those are the things. I intentionally did not put any policy recommendations, but more so tried to be very factual of what was heard. And uh, and so that that is it. I brought it up. Thank you for putting it into the record. Yeah. yeah. So what one of the community services you do? Okay. Oh, I would love that. Do we need a vote or it will be more than the public? Can I say? That's at the public meeting, too. According to John Paul, I think that Yeah, so yeah, we, we would have a public meeting. We would have, generally, we just do by unanimous consent to allow members to participate. Um, and it would be a procedural vote, so it could, it would happen prior to the vote of board leadership. Um, can I just add on to what you said? I, I too would recommend it. It was really informative. 
I thought it was going to be just a few people that are interested in the state board and were joining me. But actually, there was a good number of parents who were like, I just want to get into these schools. So that I have a child that's going to be in high school in a few years. And so there are a lot of people that leaned in that were really interested in hearing from students getting toured of high school. So right. I think it would be a great opportunity. And, and like I said, I went on, I think Amanda went on Anyway, they were so uh, they were so interesting, and they were just great. And um, you know, Zach led them, and we were talked about. And I, the part that I saw was one of the one of the students in the school. So you had to remember the students to raise all these questions with them, hear what people were saying, and it was really good. And uh, I was quite pleased by that. So. And I should say the other thing that was interesting. I'd just like to add one thing. Um, I'm holding an event in Ward 6 on diverse and inclusive schools on January 23rd from 6 to 8 p.m. at Denton Elementary. Um, I'll have a flyer later this week to invite colleagues to come. It is going to be focused specifically on Ward 6 schools, Ward 6 parents, but I'm delighted to have any and all of my colleagues come join. Um, it basically came out of the idea, there's a lot of talk right now around gentrification in the city, around opportunities for protecting schools that already have diverse student enrollments, both by race and by income level, um, and by finding ways to do more within policy uh, to encourage that kind of maintenance of diversity or allowing for diversity in schools that may have already flipped over from being diverse schools to being fully gentrified schools. Um, and thinking about practices that schools that have diverse student populations are employing to make those schools truly welcoming to all families, to make sure that no one is feeling uh, their school is invaded or that their school is being lost as a result of changes in student demographics and how um, principals and other administrators and parent groups are making things feel welcome. So we'll have more on the agenda later this week, but excited to invite any of you to join at 6 to 8 p.m. and it'll be food and chat. I will just add that this Saturday is the Board of One Educational Community and the Community Shared Drive uh, Council Members in Town Hill and we're focused on the school budget, so it's not a one speaker. Um, so if you are interested in bringing your board uh, feedback or stories from your schools, that would be great. So that's Saturday, 2 to 4 p.m. at the And the Board Three meeting. Monday, and it's about looking at the next uh, um, the next year and the budget and priorities and uh, some of the DME, some of the CPS, me for the state board. And, um, and this Saturday, <laughs> 2011, at Savoy Elementary School, uh, I am co sponsoring uh, a boarding uh, school fair. Um, this is kind of a local lives uh, fair. One, I want to thank our staff. Back to Ward 8, for, for all of uh, your families who are still looking for Ward 8 school community to call home next school year, uh, you can come by to Ward Elementary School and talk to, I think we've got uh, close to over 20 schools confirmed at this point, uh, and so this community would uh, be here as well uh, to uh, get their information with them and get them to talk to us for the lives. Free Acre Club? Uh, yes. As well as, as well as, uh, as well as the DC infrastructure as well. What is the details? So, February 1st till I can shoot around the flyer literacy fair. It'll be at, e at Alley Field, Eagle Bank. It's for families. It'll have lots of games, activities, speakers, um, read alouds, you name it. So um, feel free to post it. Uh, Alley Field, uh, the soccer field, uh, Eagle Bank, um, the whatever, Eagle Bank section of, and I'll have the flyer and shoot around all of you. Literacy fair, lots of I also want to note the, the multilingual education fair that's coming up that we are also a sponsor of on, on January 25th. Um, the same day today. No, no, no. All days are Saturday. Yeah, so oh. That's all I have. We're busy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the multi